For 15. No payments up to 90 days. Guaranteed approvals at the lowest rates in years. Even if your mama won't lend you money. Uh -huh. Downtown Richmond on Mineroo Boulevard. Shot from home in your underwear. At ColumbiaChrysler.com. Sold. Hey, it's Mark from Cal Tire. I'm standing here in our tire storage. That's right. Cal Tire offers tire storage. We got lots of space. So when you get new tires during our spring savings event, just store your winter tires with us. So come get the lowest. Prices guaranteed on select brand name tires without lugging any tires home. It's perfect. Talk to Cal during our spring savings event featuring the Nokia and WRG2. Event ends May 11th. Maynard's announces its largest half million. 30 seconds. Hybrid bikes, cruisers, and mountain bikes in over 16 styles, and all bikes are in stock and fully assembled. Bikes for youth, kids, and adults, and the entire inventory is now 30 to 50% off. Hurry into Maynard's for the best selection. A Mercury 26-inch men's or ladies' bike now only $99.99 each. The Maynard's half-million-dollar bike liquidation is on now. If you're looking for a bike, this is it. Shop two Vancouver locations or visit Maynard's.com. You're listening to The Bill Good Show. On CKNW News Talk Good morning. I, I guess the question I have is why is the media and others, uh, ref, you know, not looking at the Green Party because they refuse to cost their ever changing promises. There's no accountability. There's no clarity regarding their program priorities or the associated costs of, the, of their many platform promises. It seems to me that every party. Well, isn't that true for the conservatives? And yet they have a. They've costed, or they're costing their program promises. Well, uh, the the Greens have uh, put out a, a fairly detailed statement of what they want to do, but as Ron says, it's not being costed. And the Greens have have made the argument uh, that the war of numbers that we get during election campaigns are are just simply not credible across the board. Um, so they've they've taken a different approach here. They're trying to do politics differently. Uh, they think that might appeal to their particular constituency of, of laying out their philosophy, the direction in which they want to go, uh, and that they will, uh, when the, if they ever form the government and see what the books really say, uh, then they would uh, start to put numbers on these things. Um, I, I, I think that that's something of a risky uh, approach, um, but I do um, understand their concerns uh, that this war of numbers is, is certainly baffling and, and may not be credible. Good morning. Um, I, thought, I found it interesting. I thought you might find it interesting. When they did an interview with Glenn Clark about a couple months ago after he worked for Jimmy Patterson, um, it was a really good interview. He said how he realized after being in business now how the NDPs, uh, how they think, how they design their policies, how they um, think about business, he realized how anti-productive um, it was towards business and how it didn't help business at all. And he realized that, and he even admitted that on, on, in the interview. And I just found that really interested, interesting. And there's no way I will vote NDP, Bill. There's no way I will ever vote NDP, no matter how much I hate the Liberals right now. What Christy Clark, the Premier, should have done, I believe, she should have stepped aside because... She did so many bad things in her reign that um, she should have stepped aside. If she wanted that Liberal Party to continue, the right thing to do for her was to step aside and let someone else um, take over the leadership. Uh, so that's what, that, that's what I think.
take the party into the into the election campaign and see how she fares. Liberals may uh, get back into the game, particularly if support for one of the other parties, maybe the Conservatives, collapses. Uh, on the other hand, um, the polls could shift the, uh, the other way. Support for the Liberals may plummet further. Um, and and uh, so it's, 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 I don't know if it's a 50-50 proposition, but I think it could go either way here. My pleasure, Bill. March 1999. Adrian Dix is chief of staff to BC's premier. The RCMP corporate crime unit examined his computer, searching for evidence he forged a government document. Dix lies about his involvement in the forgery, is fired, and leaves with a $70,000 taxpayer-funded severance. Nine degrees and Terry Shintz. Severance. And now Adrian Dix wants to be premier? Can you trust Adrian Dix? On May 14th, you decide. Visit ccforbc.ca. Acura's Master the Road sales event is on now at your BC Acura retailer. Until April 30th, cash buyers save $10,000 on any new 2013 Acura MDX SUV. Featuring seven-passenger seating, super-handling all-wheel drive, and so much more. You'll drive in comfort, safety, and style. Did you catch that, Bill? Colors, too. Drive a... Tw it is nine degrees and Terry shins. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, okay, yeah, good. BC Acura retailer for details. Tonight on the David Pratt Show, the general manager of the Vancouver Canucks, Mike Gillis, on Luongo, Schneider, Kessler, and what really happened at the trade deadline. Seven o'clock tonight. It's 11 o'clock. Live from BC's news leader, this is the Bill Good Show on CKNW News Talk 980. And Bill, the NDP says it will reallocate money, raise taxes, and run deficits for three years. That's the bottom line of the party's fiscal plan laid out today. Finance critic Bruce Ralston says the carbon tax would be expanded to cover venting from the oil and gas sector. The corporate tax rate would climb one point to 12 percent in October, raising about $200 million. And a corporate capital tax would be reinstated on financial institutions. Three percent for banks and one percent for financial institutions with their head offices in B.C., including credit unions. Um, Smaller credit unions, those with a capital of less than $20 million, and there are 27 of the 44 credit unions in British Columbia would fall up below the line of exemption. Uh, they will not pay uh, this tax. As well, the NDP would hike income taxes for people earning more than $150,000 a year and kill the Liberals' planned $1,200 RESP program for children. Ralston says the changes will generate $311 million for new spending this year, and details on how that money would be spent will come during the election campaign. Employees affected by Royal Bank's decision to outsource their jobs are getting an apology and a promise they'll all be offered comparable work opportunities within the bank. RBC Chief Executive Gordon Nixon says in a letter to be published in newspapers, the bank should have been more sensitive and helpful to the workers reported to be about 45. They complained to the media they were losing their jobs to foreign workers brought to Canada to train for the work under the temporary foreign workers program. Two Kamloops RCMP officers accused of breach of trust in relation to the now infamous jail sex scandal will stand trial. Provincial Court Judge Chris Cleveley with that decision. Corporal Ken Brown and Constable Stephen Saharia, along with a civilian jail guard, David Tompkins, facing the next level of justice. Prosecutors earlier dropping a breach of trust charge against Constable Evan Elgee. 
The three to stand trial are accused of watching two intoxicated women have sex in a holding cell via video in August of 2010. The start date for that trial to be set May 6th. When Bill says we'll be back after this, you guys are going to. That was good, but I think we can do better. So we'll be back after the break. <laughs> a little bit better. I'll help you guys out though as well. Now, uh, also we're going to have some trivia questions about Fortis BC during the break. So I've got some prizes for those. So get ready, maybe start Googling about Fortis uh, in the meantime. But uh, right now, relax, get yourself a drink and prepare for Bill Good and the Chief Executives on CKNW. Thanks very much. Weird we're not hearing anything. We will hear the program sound off the top with the intro. Bill at the company in Rard in this terminal, which spans Carden, Port Moody, and Burnaby. Suncor says 225 barrels. I see a lot of or some familiar faces. How many of you have been here for other shows? Good. Keep them coming back. Nope. No? Nope. I'm starting to. That's better. Yeah, it's good. It was interesting being in Kelowna and being in uh, Soyuz. And I didn't get to your French restaurant because I got outvoted and <laughs> to go to Rod's, which was just fine too. Well, you got something else to look forward to. Yeah. So Jeff, we'll just hear it right off the top. Okay. And we are live at the Beatty School of Business at SFU's downtown campus. And as you could hear, we have a live and uh, hopefully lively audience here, uh, many attending the uh, Beatty School of Business. Uh, Mr. Walker, good morning and thank you for doing this. Good morning, Bill. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll hear about Fortis as, as we go on, but I want to find out a bit about you. Where did it start? Uh, where, did you, where did you grow up? Uh, I'm a native Newfoundlander, so I grew up, uh, spent 
all my childhood in a small mining town in uh, central Newfoundland, so I was one of those few Newfoundlanders that didn't grow up around the, uh, the water. My dad is from uh, Nova Scotia, my mother's a Newfoundlander. He moved to Newfoundland to play a little hockey and never went home, so I spent my time there. And I, most of my education was in uh, at Memorial, and uh, I have a, an undergraduate degree, Bachelor of Science, and then I did my MBA there as well. But uh, before going back to Memorial, I had a, a brief flirt with the military. I went into uh, the military, a military college and felt that that was going to be my route to uh, fame and glory and all kinds of wonderful things. But I guess I, I was neither going to be an officer nor a gentleman in the context of that. So it was a great experience, <laughs> but I, I chose to leave. Do you remember your first job? Uh, absolutely. I, I Sort of all my life as a kid, it's uh, always had a... Some people would call it a hustle, but I, I always had things on the go, whether it was newspaper routes or picking up scrap metal or uh, uh, whatever. It, it just seemed to be something that was I always chased it down. I guess the first real summer job I had would have been, again, growing up in a mining town, would have been working with prospectors. So I spent a lot of time in the bush and uh, made some great money. And, but it also gave me some really great experiences. I had 18, 19 years old, and I was leading a crew of 50 folks. And uh, I don't know if that was a foreshadowing of things to come, but it was uh, something I quite enjoyed. But was it something that led you to future leadership roles? Uh, hard, to, hard to say. Uh, I guess it's something... When you look at leadership and sort of self-assessment, it's very difficult, uh, hard to look at yourself. I always say to other people, got to judge that. But uh, for me, it was always, I could never sit in the middle of the pack or I could never sit on the sideline. Even if I tried, it just innately wanted to get out there. If there was something that needed to be changed or I thought I could influence, uh, I sort of aspired to that. Did you grow up aspiring to anything specific? Because I, I, I find myself doubting that, uh, that a, a 15 or 16 year old would say, I want to be the CEO of a major energy company. Well, no, uh, it's that sort of aspiration, I really aspired to get a job. That was, that was the first thing. And <laughs> Good start. You, you grew up, it was a, really a blue collar town, it was a mining town. My mom was a nurse, uh, my dad, uh, worked on uh, in a machine shop and then the latter part of his career with the mining company uh, worked in recreation so we ran all the recreation facilities which was quite convenient when you grow up with three brothers and we all played hockey in every sport that uh, if you hit it or chased it that we were after it so so your role models weren't in that uh, my family I had lots of family in the military maybe that was part of the inclination there I had uh, a lot of folks who were mostly tra grew up in the trade side of the business, some nurses, some teachers, and that sort of thing. But the concept of a CEO is, would have been very foreign. So uh, it wasn't a great plan. That, that question has been put to me by students when I've had a chance to speak uh, at the Okanagan College, particularly on a couple of occasions. But I sort of meandered into this opportunity, I believe. Did the military experience influence you, do you think? Uh, no, I, I think it absolutely, uh, one is I, I felt, I always felt I grew up quicker. Uh, I could even perceive the changes in myself when I, I took one year. I had one year, the reason for one year is that after that you're committed. You had to buy your way out. You're an indentured servant if they got the education. So I chose to leave and I think it was both a great choice uh, personally and probably for the military. But I, 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 lear I learned a lot from it, but I always felt I matured quite quickly from there. And again, military colleges, you know, they recruit heavily on academic background uh, coming out of high school, but they're also looking for leadership qualities and trying to project that forward, which is, a, as I've come to appreciate more and more, is a very difficult thing to do. Were you a good student? Um, in high school, I, I did very, very well. In university, I was less than diligent in some of my early years, and, uh, but that was a great learning, uh, one of my great learnings of life. Uh, and as I progressed, and I, I think I had to grow up a little bit more and mature, and uh, obviously it, I did well in university as I went on. And you did your MBA? I did my MBA. And how important was that? Uh, and I think many people in this audience will be curious to, to hear how you answer it. Uh, how, how much did that do toward uh, advancing your future career? Oh, well, let me back up just a little bit. It's, uh, it's confessional time, but uh, I did an undergraduate degree uh, in Bachelor of Science, but my major is in psychology with a minor in mathematics. And it's a really interesting combination if you think about it a little bit. But I, the reason all the mathematics got in there is when I started military college, they, uh, they intended to make me an engineer, of which that didn't transpire either. 
And I find it quite ironic today that I, I oversee lots of engineers and lots of technical people as part of my role. And uh, so when I, when I finished that and I, I did my honors thesis in sort of getting retribution for some of my earlier uh, times and a little bit too much social life, and the MBA for me was really to give me a perspective on business and some finance and sort of rounding out, give me uh, a credible resume to look for the first job, uh, you know, a significant job as we, I was leaving university. What advice would you give to people here today who are just starting out in their careers? I think um, the biggest advice for me is that one is that everything's about learning. The other thing is that you're not going to get it from a textbook. And I think the greatest teaching I ever had, you know, when, when I was a kid, I was worked for the mining company at home one summer before I got jobs in the bush. And the gentleman there was a mining engineer. He was a, he was a, a German uh, immigrant, and he had been in the Second World War, and, and, and he was a very different person from what I experienced in my hometown. He, they didn't have a television in their house, and we couldn't understand how one would survive, how you couldn't watch hockey, whatever else was on the go with the two channels that we had. He was an artist, self-taught, listened to classical music. But him and I were sitting down one day and uh, just having a general chat, and he was asking me about what I was doing. And uh, so he looked at it and he said, talked about education. He said, education is most important. It's a liberal arts education. Because he asked me what I was studying, and he was an engineer. And he said, the biggest thing you can get from a university is to teach yourself to think, to challenge and move forward. And I think that's the biggest thing that comes from an education, regardless of the discipline. And I think that sometimes we get so structured on, I need to become and have a skill of uh, an engineer, a doctor, a nurse, uh, these sorts of things. And uh, he put a university in a little different perspective. He said it's, it's an institution of learning. And he really questioned whether you, things like en engineering, those sorts of things, should actually be in the university curricula. It was more of a technical thing. But th that was quite an eye-opening. So my advice is that continue to learn, expand your mind. Um, Go back to an MBA for a little bit. We have tons of folks in my uh, my operation who have that. It's a great a great uh, tool. Gives some great skill sets that round things out. And, but if you get trapped in the administration, the A part of that, and the analysis part of that, uh, I think that's can be limiting. The challenge is to how do you expand beyond that. When we come back, I want to find out what you look for when you're actually hiring the people that you're talking about, whether they're engineers or whatever they might be. Uh, John Walker, the CEO of Fortis, and we'll be back with more on uh, the Chorus Radio Network right after this. Thank you, John. Some very good advice there. Does anyone have any questions for John Walker so far? We have microphones at, uh, at either side. If uh, any of you would like to uh, step up to a microphone and ask a question, um, sometimes it takes until the next segment to get, uh, get you to do that, but I think we see somebody coming up right now. Um, hi there, I'm Erin Lane. I'm from the, I'm doing an MBA at the Beatty School of Business. I'm also a fellow Newfoundlander, so. Um, and my question for you is, how do you deal with uncertainty with respect to the future energy mix and supply in BC? Oh. <laughs> I, I, the big thing about, I think, whether we're in the energy sector or whether we're in, the, uh, in any other business, is that there's a tremendous amount of uh, change going on. And I think that the one thing that I've learned, and it continues to be reinforced more and more, is that we underestimate the level of innovation that's transpiring. And to be able to adapt to that, what most organizations and what we're trying to prepare our organization for, is to, to be as flexible and as nimble so that we can adapt to those opportunities or those challenges as they come along. My view of the future around en energy is that it will be a multi-use environment where there's going to be how vehicles are run, there'll probably be natural gas and there'll be some electric, there'll be hybrids, because I don't see at this point any one solution being complete for any of that. I think the customers are going to drive a lot more choice. Today, we are pushing our customers down roads and forcing them into choices through policy and other criteria. And to my mind, that translates that we don't trust the customers to make the right decisions. But ultimately, I believe it, that's what's going to transpire. Thank you. Thank you. I might steal that. <laughs> <clears throat> Great question. Any other questions so far? 
No? Yes? You mentioned adapting to you mentioned adapting to innovation. Um, is Fortis actively pursuing uh, strategies of innovation? And, and, and what does R&D mean to Chad, to how Fortis? much time left? It's kind of a big question. Um, we're not actively, we don't have a research and development uh, arm. We actively monitor the market and see what's going on. We see what are the things where we want to put products and services in place. So we're, we try to keep ourselves aware of those opportunities. Uh, obviously, we're moving down the roads for natural gas for transportation and adapting to those opportunities that are coming in. We're putting in alternative energy pieces, whether it's district energy, uh, discrete energy systems, and these sorts of things. So th those kinds of things we're adapting to and innovating on that end of it. We've got about a minute left before we go into the next segment. Any other questions from the audience today? No? Tamara can't stand quiet. <laughs> That's what the weekends are for, am I right? <laughs> well, quickly, I'll ask one of our first uh, trivia questions today. We've got some prizes, including one of these CKNW mugs here. Who can name the two utilities that Fortis BC manage? The two main ones, anybody? Really? Nobody can answer that question? We'll get an answer before we're done. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about these today. The utilities you use in your home regularly. <clears throat> yes? Electricity and gas is correct. Well done. I'll give you a prize. Mm. Okay, thanks. Ten About seconds. ten seconds left, guys. <coughs> Talking with the Fortis CEO, John Walker, the kinds of qualities you look for in people that you're hiring, and uh, I'm assuming that you have a team at the top of Fortis that, that you rely on. So what do, what do you look for when you're, when you're interviewing or hiring? Well, I, th I think a couple of things is that when most people will come into our organization, come in uh, at, at a different level, uh, so when we first start hiring, obviously we're hiring for uh, technical skills or specific uh, capabilities, whether it's accounting, finance, uh, trades, those sorts of things. So there's a, a lot of elements. What becomes very interesting is that as we get people in the organization, part of that is, again, is trying to understand uh, those that we believe have possessed the qualities of leadership that can rise through the organization. Because one of the things you'll find out very quickly is that whether you start out as an engineer or whether you have an MBA or whether you're an accountant, is that in most organizations, when you, if you're aspirational and you want to move up through it, what really becomes most, most important are, are leadership skills. And I believe they're also the most difficult skills to one, to project forward, and uh, two, they're difficult to find in people in general. It's interesting. I was just thinking uh, from a political point of view. I remember being asked during the liberal leadership <coughs> campaign whether I thought Christy Clark would be a good premier. And my answer, which I think surprised her, was, I don't know. You don't know until somebody is in that role. And I, and I suspect it's somewhat similar in business. It's one thing to be a good 2IC, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they can lead the organization. I uh, know that's, uh, that's definitely true. And I think just on the concept of leadership, it's something that sort of uh, has become very important in my life. It's probably one of the most important aspects of my job these days is trying to plan forward, succession planning, uh, projecting, the, making sure we got the capability and capacity in the organization to move forward and to deal with some of these issues and challenges and, and uh, complexities that are out there in front of us. And I think when you think about leaders historically, uh, some have been great leaders. Churchill always comes to my mind as a, a great war leader, but a horrible peacetime leader. And it was certain qualities where he could, that autocratic style worked when you had to make decisions and he, he did it without fear or trepidation. But in peacetime when you needed more consensus building and a little bit more democracy, it wasn't, it wasn't available to him. Some people are one-dimensional and fit a certain time. But I think the great leaders that, that go through life uh, basically find a way to continue to evolve uh, into the various situations. How important is decision making, the ability to make a decision sometimes a tough decision to your job? Um, it's critical, it's probably the fundamental thing. Exercising judgment 
is what will separate a lot of people. Folks who can live, one can assess and determine the risk because there's a lot of uncertainty, you'll never have full knowledge. And you get as much impact, uh, input as you possibly can. Uh, the other thing is that people figure that I can just do more analysis and more spreadsheets and get more input. And the truth is that time also is a variable that changes things. So the real piece, piece is right now is making a decision to, to, to move or not move and then having the confidence both in yourself and your team more, more particularly that we can manage and deal with the things that come up as a result of that decision, both to take advantage of new opportunities or to mitigate risk as we go forward. You talked about being nimble. You're in an industry that it seems to me is, is ever changing and in, in some ways, well, it's a bit like this industry. You don't know what the change is going to look like and, until it happens. Yeah, it, what makes this industry really interesting as well is that we're in a, a certain segment of the in, uh, energy sector where we're regulated, we're highly regulated in terms, of, in terms of what we can invest, how we invest money, get approval of budgets for the uh, British Columbia Utilities Commission primarily. We also have safety regulators and a whole bunch of other things that we have to adhere to. But So our ability, historically utilities, uh, uh, monopolistic utilities have been accused of not being very innovative, not being very nimble and sort of stuck in your ways and, and having this concept of a guaranteed return. Today it's changing radically and we've got to get all the pieces moving in the same way. Policy is happening very quickly, customer knowledge is changing, innovation and new energy sources are available uh, to, uh, to fuel that customer choice, yet we still have to be in the regulatory model and so how do we bring technology in when there's uncertain outcomes and we have a regulator that likes to see cost and benefit put together and it's sometimes very difficult to give that absolutely. To what degree are you driven by what the customer <coughs> wants? Uh, from my point of view we've been trying to get our organizations and this has really been a theme in the Fortis world uh, for the last uh, 25 years is that we have really tried to move our organizations now much more into be absolutely being customer focused and trying to understand that customer and I believe that that's still a place that we're evolving is that we try to understand um, uh, the customer and what they want in particular situations and part of it is helping to educate them about energy because we all use it, it's hugely convenient, uh, it's highly reliable in the societies that we live in, it's very safe and yet uh, and we tend to take it for granted but people don't really understand it in terms of what it takes to get that to your house. But it, also, it does have to be delivered and we see such arguments these days not so much over natural gas as over oil, but it all has to be delivered, whether it's LNG or whether it's natural gas or whether it's, it's crude oil, it has to be delivered some way, and yet at the moment there seems to be a real aversion of the part of the public to things like pipelines. Um, I, I, no, absolutely. You know, we, we tend to, I think it all comes with change. And I think the people, human beings, and I go back to my, uh, my undergraduate degree, which, uh, like I said, was in psychology of my major, human behavior is quite interesting. That's actually probably more relevant today in a lot of things I do and assess. People resist change at every level, and they believe that by staying the same that nothing is going to change, but the, the environment and the world around you is changing. If we don't adapt here in British Columbia to the opportunities in a very a proper way that we have lots of regulation and, and good standards, good law and all those sorts of things, good governance in general. If, but if we don't adapt, other parts of the world will adapt and they will seize those opportunities. And what we believe, what will happen, the consequence of that is ultimately a diminished lifestyle for ourselves and particularly for future generations as we go forward. I think that we've become, as Canadians, very complacent at times and that's a concern to me that uh, we've gotten through the, the economic crisis of this world over the last five years reasonably well. We're not out of that woods, in my opinion, yet, globally. Um, but we're not immune from those effects. And, and we got, every time you make a decision, you run the risk of good things happening or not so good things happening or great opportunities being uh, presented or we're going to have big missed opportunities. And we have to change and adapt to that. Back with much more with uh, John Walker, CEO of Fortis BC, right after the news headlines next. Thank you, John. Any questions from the audience so far? Aha. <coughs> uh -huh. No, she's sneaking out. I thought you were going <laughs> to the microphone. Don't do that. <laughs> 
All right, well, let's continue with some... Yes? I think that uh, we, one is you recognize we, we are monopolistic and that's the way it, it has to be because you're not going to have multiple wires or pipes into a house. So you accept regulation. I think what's, what really needs to change to my mind is the, you need to have the capability and the capacity and the regulatory framework to ensure that they understand one where the policymakers are trying to go. And, and how, the, how we as utilities and other businesses fit into delivering into that. And I think if there's any consternation that I get on a daily basis is that we're not quite certain that everything is aligned. That when we go in and we present to the regulator that we're delivering into the expectation, we believe we have a very good sense of what the customer wants or needs. Uh, apart from lower prices, which is always a consequence of some of the things we do. And then the policymaker, we try to be in touch with the government of the day, trying to understand what they really intend to get to. But when we try to get into it, one, we're getting into longer processes, again, intervention where people are coming in. One's because they don't like something, they have a separate agenda. It's not always from making sure that we're doing the right thing, that we've got the right price, we've thought it well through, and all that sort of thing. That's the tension. But I think good regulation is uh, necessary. And in fact, I would suggest that we would embrace it as a, as a way to, to ensure to the public and our customer base that we're doing the right things. Any other questions from the audience? No? Well, that All means right. I'm going to have to think of something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll ask you a quick trivia question for a prize. We've got some t-shirts, some umbrellas, some coffee mugs as well for you guys <coughs> today. Uh, it was mentioned in the opening spiel about Mr. John Walker here today. How many average customers does BC Fortis have? Yes, you're very quick. That's correct, congratulations. Now, would you like a t-shirt, a coffee mug, or an umbrella? Nice. All right, our next question. Has anyone played the, uh, the game The Price is Right? Everyone familiar with that? The higher, lower part? All right, so we're going to do that here with the approximate number of employees that BC Fortis has. Any ideas? Yeah, would you like to start? Just yes. Yep, 2,600. How did you know that? What was the question? How many average employees they have? 2,300 on the dot. Well done. Congrats. It, it, another was in, it was in the opening. <laughs> it was in the opening as well. There you go. <laughs> Oh, you've done your research today. Bit of a BC Fortis fan. <laughs> Get an umbrella this time. <laughs> there you go. Congratulations. All right, we've got one minute left. Any questions from the audience before we go back into the break? Yes? I'm not sure there's time to answer it before we come out of the news, but it's a subject that I'm going to touch on in the next segment, so thanks, Jeff. Less than a minute? Yeah, 40 seconds. About 40 seconds if anyone wants to grab a quick drink or anything in the meantime. Yes. I'd like to know what is Mr. Walker core value and principle We've that you believe? Pardon me? Your core value and principle that you believe in management. Uh, core, we'll, we'll come back to it in the next break. Okay, sorry about that.
We are live at the Beattie School of Business at uh, SFU's downtown campus today. John Walker leads Fortis BC as president and uh, chief executive officer. I'm going to ask you a bit of an off-the-wall question here. You look, you look at energy on a daily basis. If you were thinking of buying a new car, would you be looking at a traditional gas-driven car? Would you be looking at a hybrid? Would you be looking at an electric vehicle? Where do you think the future is when it comes to automotive? Oh boy, um, I, I, I go back to a comment I made earlier. Is that I believe that it's, it's, going to, it's going to depend. It's going to be a, a personal choice depending on what you are. Uh, when you look at just from an electric point of view right now is that I, I see the concerns there. One is high cost with, with the vehicles. They're not, and when you look at the car dealerships, I don't think they're selling all that extraordinarily well. So that could be a demand thing that could uh, see that falter. The other thing is that right now it's a short commute and depend, it's going to depend on several things. If you live in a, a place with a lot of slow traffic, you could be on a parking lot. If you live in a cold climate or a hot climate and air conditioning, it could diminish uh, usage. I think. We're already seeing hybrids. I think they're being better embraced. We're sort of the gas electric. They could be natural gas electric as we go forward. Uh, we're seeing in our own business uh, good opportunities for natural gas. We've been focused on a very specific sector there in terms of uh, return to base fleets. And that's really because we, one of the encumbrances of trying to get any of this to go is how do you recharge or refuel with return to base fleets, we can build a singular fueling station and over time, hopefully, it will catch on and move forward. And when it comes to, um, uh, I th just think it's going to be a hybrid depending on what your needs are and what you're, where you sit and how you look at it. Yeah, I hear talk about BC ferries redoing their fleet and going to natural gas to try to reduce costs. Is that feasible? Uh, we, we certainly believe it's feasible. Uh, and there's, two, uh, there's a couple things. Uh, one is that if you try to retrofit boats, I'm not a naval architect, but obviously there's time constraints and whether it will happen in the, can you move your fleet in and out? That's one thing. Two is what you will do with new vessels, which is probably more certain. And I think there's a couple of things. One is that they're not new. They're being used in other parts of the world uh, quite significantly. Uh, in uh, Europe, particularly, the United States is starting to look at it. Quebec is actually going ahead with uh, putting LNG ferries in place. And they bring a number of advantages. One is that they uh, are, obviously right now we have a huge price advantage uh, against diesel. Uh, there's lower emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, lower particulate. Uh, and the other great thing for us here at British Columbia, it's a, a made in BC product that we get a chance to use as well. So I think there's great opportunities in that particular uh, world. What about the future of liquefied natural gas? You already have one, don't you? Uh, <laughs> Actually, uh, Fortis BC, we actually have 40% of the LNG plants in Canada. We have two of five. Uh, but they're designed around a different, we, we liquefy and we store basically right now, our system, these uh, LNG plants are designed uh, to enable us to, if we have a disruption in our system or if we have a, a real peak period, we can pull from our plants. Uh, we have one in, uh, the, the newest one is on uh, Vancouver Island up in Ladysmith. Uh, it's a uh, one BCF, one billion cubic feet uh, storage plant up there. The other is in Tilbury in the Delta area, and that's been in operation since 1971. And we're currently using some of the liquefaction uh, capability there right now to spur this LNG in the transportation sector, so we're using it from there. So we're into that sector right now. We're not, when you look at LNG... Oh, okay. We're in the break. Can you get it back? Sorry for the interruption. We've got a slight technical difficulty, we so we'll be back soon. <laughs> In the meantime, what was that question, sorry, about core values and beliefs, was it? Yes, John, your core values and beliefs. Core values and beliefs. Well, I'll talk about both personally and corporately because I think, they're, I think they need to become embedded. Uh, obviously, we live in a business that we deal potentially with some dangerous commodities and electricity and natural gas. So safety is absolutely paramount in our business. So we reinforce that on a, on a daily basis. Teamwork is critical. Uh, becoming more critical as uh, the world's become more complex and 
uh, fast moving. You guys have great people around you to make sure you work on that sort of thing. I personally believe in, in candor. I like to speak straightforwardly. Uh, I don't like to talk around things too much. It's not to be offensive, but I think it's the, the clear way. We live in a world today where there's a lot of ambiguity in communication. And so I like a culture, I keep saying a culture of candor uh, in, our, in our organization. Uh, I, loyalty is important. Um, people talk about loyalty. It's not about personal loyalty, but it's certainly loyalty to the objectives of the organization and what you're trying to move forward. And uh, you have to embrace that. If you can't embrace that, I don't think you can contribute as, as you go forward. Uh, honesty and integrity, being, all those sort of qualities that we talk about are uh, uh, very, very integral to how I try to live my own life and, and how we want to live our, our life in our organization. Um, we don't have billboards around our company with uh, value systems. I believe you embrace that and you live it and uh, that's, that's how you make sure that's the way you operate. Any other quick questions? We've Jeff, we'll be back left. in business. Well, just quickly while we're waiting to come back, uh, a couple things. Next week, of course, we've got Tracy Reddies, who is the CEO of Coast Capital. Now, it won't be back here. It will be at the Harbour Centre, so just down the road there. And uh, same time again, of course, from 11 till 12. So make sure you register for that at the BD School of <coughs> Business or head to cknw.com and you can click on there to register as well. And just speaking about upcoming guests as well, our uh, CEO of WestJet, Greg yeah. Soretsky, is on... We're back live at uh, SFU's Beatty School of Business. John Walker is my guest, and uh, we took a <coughs> little bit of an early break. We had just a, just a little leak in our pipeline there, and uh, we, got it, we got it solved very quickly. So c come back to the business of liquefied natural gas, and what is the difference between natural gas that we use today and liquefied natural gas? Basically, there is no difference. The, the commodity is exactly the same. It's, it's just that liquefied natural gas is super cooled. And it, it's a way to be able to transport high density, high amounts of natural gas. The more you liquefy it, the more you can, uh, and you contain it under pressure and you can move it around. So it becomes more transportable. Before we got into efficient ways to liquefy, you were constrained by land-based or even sub-water sub uh, piping systems. Uh, that was, that's the biggest difference. How realistic is it to talk of three to five different plants in northern BC? Uh, I can, I, well, I'm not directly involved in that. That's not part of our business. We're, we're basically, we transmit uh, uh, natural gas and we distribute primarily. Uh, obviously what's going on up north is of interest to us because we get some of our supply from uh, the northern BC. Uh, when I look at it, and I, I look at it in the context of sort of global opportunity, Natural gas is unlike oil from my point of view, that there won't be a cartel. It's not restricted to Saudi Arabia or the Middle East or Nigeria or, or Venezuela it's, or Canada for that matter. It's going to be, it's more global. And the technology that I talked about, the innovation has really opened that up. And we've got other parts of the world, whether it's Qatar with idle LNG capacity significant, we've got Australia who's building significant uh, capacity. And I think it's going to be how do we fit into that and what the markets will be. And we've got to be able to do that on a cost-competitive cost basis because we really are dealing with a commodity. So to your question, I believe that we've got an opportunity to, uh, to get some plants in place, but I don't think we're going to see five. And how important is it going to be to the economy of BC and to the economy of places like Prince Rupert, where we visited uh, a few weeks ago and where there's a lot of hope that it is going to bring prosperity to a region that's been pretty battered by recession for the past uh, decade or more? Well, I think it's important for all of us in British Columbia. I think it's also important in a, even in a Canadian context. Uh, on a whole variety, I think it's got a fiscal contribution to make uh, from social programs to taxation or whatever on that end of it. I think we also got to remember as Canadians, we've always made our living substantially in the resource sector. As I said earlier, I come from a mining town that's been depleted for 30 years, but it's, uh, it, you, you grew up on that sort of thing, whether it was forestry, mines, and now it's natural gas. It's just another, another resource that has high value uh, that we, we need to exploit. And from the communities 
that are up there. These have generally been resource-based communities, They've, from whether it's been forestry sector or whether it's been mining. Fishing. So I think they're very important. Talk a little bit about uh, a day in the life of John Walker. Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you balance work and, uh, and life? Um, I'm not sure. Well, my wife probably puts it in best perspective. If I ever talk about retirement, she says, well, where are you going to go? <laughs> because you, someone said, the other great expression was you get uh, twice the husband and half the pay or something to that effect. But, <laughs> but uh, right now is that work really dominates, uh, and not from the point of view that I would ever character myself, characterize myself as a workaholic, but I'm, I'm in touch with work on a continuous basis and technology sort of lends that to you. And I'm very comfortable with that, uh, that ability. Uh, I don't put myself in the category of a micromanager. In fact, I rely quite heavily and, uh, and, and uh, trust my team to deliver, and that makes my life pretty easy. Um, because a lot of what I do, you can sort of, it's, it's a thought process and thinking about it, unless I find a way to de detach my brain uh, from my head or my head from my shoulders, uh, it's hard to distract. And the other thing is I, I just love it. So it's not that part. Now, I also enjoy uh, time off in terms of, I like to read, we like to travel, my wife and I. Uh, I play a lot of bad golf. I still, I still, I still say I play hockey, but I think it's more about the beer after and the shower these days. But uh, and people tolerate me, so I enjoy those sorts of things. But you do take time to do those things. Absolutely. I, I, I look. My weekends are pretty, uh, pretty sacred. I, I'm able to look after most of my weekends unless we got something really big on the go. And you, uh, you maintain a home in Kelowna. You don't actually live in in Vancouver. That's correct. And uh, when you look at it, people have asked me about that a lot of times. It's, uh, it's not sort of situational. I, my, my company is pretty large uh, overall. I have some external obligations as well as you've heard from some boards and that sort of thing. Um, so I was going to be traveling regardless of where I lived. And it's more important to me is that we've been in British Columbia for eight years now. And we've settled quite nicely in, in, a, in probably the most beautiful part of Canada, in my opinion. But, uh, and I come from a great province of Newfoundland. But it's, uh, so we're very settled out there. So it's, I, we, things are great from a home life point of view. I had some, my family have moved, actually migrated out here into the Cologne area, so it's, it's good. And I was gonna be traveling anyway. You, you say you do take time to read. When you, when you read, what do you read? Um, on vacation, I tend to read, uh, uh, I, I'm not a science fiction person. One of the authors I really like is actually a local author out of uh, Kelowna that I discovered a few years ago, Jack White. And uh, so I've been reading some of his books. He's, been, he's written a couple of tri trilogies. I'm two books into his most recent one about Robert de Bruce and that sort of thing. And he, won, he wrote, the first ones I got into it was about the Templars. Uh, it was quite good. Uh, other reading, I tend to lead, uh, read a lot of books about leadership <laughs> and change management these days, but that's probably reflective of both my interest on the business side and some of the things that we're going into. You were talking uh, a little earlier about transitions. Are, are you in the position of looking for your replacement? Uh, I think that's uh, always, that's one of the fundamental attributes of any leadership position is, is making sure that you're trying to groom people within your organization to replace you. It's, it's your, one of your fundamental responsibilities. But your wife isn't going to allow you to be replaced, so how do you square that circle? I, I think she's just going to buy, get me an office somewhere, get me some playmates and go, go, go play golf, whatever you need to do. But don't get on, she's the CEO of the house, so. <laughs> I have to go get my own friends, I think is what she's telling me. There's a, there's a wise man. Uh, talk about the, the, the qualities that you have, you talked about reading about leadership. Um, are there leaders, you touched on Winston Churchill, but are there, are there leaders in the business world that, uh, that you admire or have, uh, have tried to pattern some of your life after? Um, I think, I, you know, basically I talk about people in general is that uh, I, people say about uh, mentors and who you've learned from. And you know, I've had one of these great things where I've always learned something from almost everybody I've ever met in my life, no matter what they've done for a living and I've always found that it's uh, what people do is, is very important because I part of my life my working life within the Fortis world is I spent f almost 16 years outside the regulated world in hotels and real estate and telecommunications we were involved in some of those businesses so I, I work with uh, room attendants and uh, waiters and waitresses and serving staff and all these sorts of things and I've learned a lot 
about what it takes to run that. So I've learned a lot about leadership from the bottom up as opposed to the top down. When I think of business people, like I've had good, good folks inside my own company, my, my current boss, Stan Marshall, the CEO of the organization, uh, of the broader Fortis world, is him and I have been friends and uh, contemporaries for almost 30 years. So I've learned a lot there. I've learned a lot from uh, uh, people within our organization and outside. I, I look at others that, uh, like Colin Powell is a guy I've been reading about quite a bit recently. They, he has struck me both in terms of what I've read in the book, I've never met him personally, but the humility, the focus on the team, focus on getting results, and those sorts of things. And uh, th that's where I come from. When I look at the business world, sometimes the folks that get all of the attention are uh, the star quality CEOs, and I'm not quite sure that's uh, where I would look for uh, guidance. We may have just had a little bit of foreshadowing about what I call my Vanity Fair section where I ask each of the CEOs if they could choose four people living or dead to have dinner with, who they would be and why. And it, uh, it's been a fascinating uh, uh, series within the series, if you will. So we'll come back and ask John Walker about uh, that dinner party when we come back. Questions from the audience? Yes. Just a technical one. If we're successful at major export of LNG, does it have a, an effect on the domestic price? Uh, from everything we can understand right now, obviously this is something we watch very closely and we're in touch with uh, the policymakers to make sure they're very aware of it. We believe that there's so much supply up there right now that uh, we don't see it as being a, an issue for putting undue pressure or inordinate pressure on the price. That's what we understand from this at this point. Can I ask you a question in the spirit of a culture of candor? Pardon me? In the spirit of a culture of candor, can I ask you a personal question? Sure, go ahead. About your salary? I'm not interested in the amount. I'm just interested in the respective ratio between the median in your organization and what's happened to yours. It's really the question about the escalation and difference, the way wealth is stratified in our society. And your thoughts on that? Uh, no problem. You can go read about it anywhere. It's all public anyway. But uh, uh, on a personal level, uh, salary increases have uh, tracked about the same levels, the increases within the organization in general uh, on an annual basis. Uh, from our point of view and within our organization, we obviously we have to make sure we can attract and retain uh, capable people. And it's like all skill sets today, we have challenging hot jobs in a number of areas, but uh, when we're looking at leadership and executive talent, uh, it's uh, done on a national survey. Uh, we, we chose as an organization, we pay at the median, so we're not at the extreme high or the low, so 50% above and below. That's the, that's the target uh, matrix that we're within. Great. Uh, as I was saying before, our CEO of WestJet, Greg Saretsky, mm. uh, special time now of 10 till 11. So make Jen, sure you mark that into your break? calendars. 10 till 11, straight back here. So uh, that'll be in a couple of weeks' time. So make sure you register down. for that at the Beatty yeah, School of Business. Well, the mountain pass is still been a little bit tricky. Mm -hmm. A little bit of tricky up in that mountain pass is still with the yeah. rain and stuff. We're getting a bit of snow and fog up there. We got snow going just from Osoyas to Kelowna. That day we were up there. It turned out nice in Kelowna, but it was. I was in Winnipeg last week, so it was a great oh. reflection of why I would love to be living in the Okanagan. So, <laughs> a reminder. I was born in Winnipeg, and my, my dad said he used to go back once a year just to remind himself never to move back to live. <laughs> I have a brother that lives there, so yeah. I keep asking him why. Shouldn't disparage Winnipeg. Well, it's a great community, but I don't think I could take either the winter or the summer. No, it's, uh, it's a bit like Newfoundland weather, I think, without the ex absolute extremes. Just look at 52. <coughs> we'll have about six minutes.
Final few minutes from the Beattie School of Business with uh, Fortis CEO and President John Walker. Four people, living or dead, that you could uh, sit down to have dinner with. Who would they be, and uh, most importantly, why? Well, that's an interesting, uh, interesting question. Um, I think I would reflect on the dead a little bit more. Uh, one of the persons, and probably brought to mind this week again, Maggie Thatcher would be an interesting person. Um, I think of what all went on that era, Gorbachev and uh, uh, Reagan and those folks, but it was people like Maggie Thatcher, Mandela. I, I look at uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, those kinds of folks would be the group that I would like to have dinner with. And there's one on the family side. I would really be, look forward to being able to sit down with some of my grandparents. There's a lot of questions I'd like to ask. Uh, I have a, a deep family uh, background, a close family, but uh, my grandfathers and uh, grandmothers would be great to explore. One of them I had a chance to know most of my life. She died late, but, uh, but and the reason I'd like to talk to a lot of those people and set aside my family for a moment, the common theme is that they were, they were in the midst of, of great change. And they came at it from different perspectives. Uh, Martin Luther King came at it much more from a societal, social change and, and, and those sorts of things. And how, what gave him the courage to stand up to do those sorts of things. Uh, all of those leaders, all those folks in their, in their way were very courageous because they went against the, the theme. And again, go back to Thatcher in the news today. She's very polarizing even in death in terms of what, uh, she's, what she's done. And I find some of it probably a little... Um, unfair because people can't say what would have happened if they had continued down the road that they were going with the unions and those sorts of things. But it was because they had great courage, what gave them the conviction, they had a strong vision of getting to an outcome, and uh, they carried it out. It would be interesting to be at the dinner with uh, Margaret Thatcher and Nelson Mandela because yes. she didn't support him. She referred to him, I was reminded last night on the news, as a terrorist. Uh, it, uh, so, it, you know, it, it was it, interesting when you look back because Brian Mulroney was quite close to Margaret Thatcher, yet Mulroney was very diligent in trying to rid South Africa of apartheid. So even though they had, a, had some major differences, they, their conservatism seemed to bring, bring them together. And I, and I don't, I think that's the great thing about when you, if you're going to have a, a, a dinner party or any discussion, is to get perspectives that are outside of your comfort zone. It's very easy to gravitate to things that you want to hear or read what you want that support your belief, but it's very important, I believe, to be challenged outside of that. And uh, I don't think we're doing enough of that these days. And uh, that, that sort of tension is a positive thing. Do you take being challenged in, uh, in your job to be a good thing? I mean, do you, do you give your other executives license to really challenge you? Uh, it's an absolute requirement. Uh, I believe that I have a, a strong opinion about many things and I have a passion to push it forward. And when you put a title and position behind that, it sometimes it can be overwhelming. But because of that, I also understand that I need to make sure that uh, people put the right questions forward. And it's not, I always try to live by the mantra, don't tell me what I want to hear, tell me what I need to hear. And you mean it. And I seriously mean that. What's your biggest challenge looking, looking three years out? Well, I think it's uh, continuing. We have a lot of policy changes. Uh, obviously, we're headed into an election here in the next month or so here in British Columbia. Whenever you move into that, particularly in an industry like energy, which is so hypersensitive and so, uh, so exposed in the media and everything, uh, how policy will unfold, it, uh, we need to see how that will, sh uh, will shape itself. And that will be a big determinant as we go forward. We also know that irrespective of that, there are external things that are going on in the marketplace and uh, the innovation I spoke about earlier. All those things are continuing regardless of our political situation. We've got less than a minute left, but do you prepare yourself, do you prepare your company for a change in government? Uh, basically, we try to, when we look at government and politics, we try to be agnostic. We obviously the, the government power of the, uh, the day is who you deal a lot with, but we've always, always maintained uh, relationships with all the parties uh, that have been involved. Uh, and again, it's that we always know that the prospect for, for uh, is there for change, and we have to take a long-term perspective. Our business is a very long-term uh, business. Mr. Walker, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate you taking time out of a busy schedule. You'll be heading back to Kelowna 
this afternoon, and we will be heading back uh, to the CKW news desk for the major news to noon next. And Simi Sarah will be here to take you through the afternoon, 12.35 to 3, on CKNW News Talk 980. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.